Hi there, my name is Tim Gill and I'm principal cellist of the London Sinfonietta. Um, this is the first of uh, a series of uh, Lockdown Live specials um, and it's called An Introduction to uh, Contemporary Instruments and it's going to happen at five o'clock every Monday for the next six weeks um, and there'll be a different instrument each week. Uh, so, uh, London Sinfonietta is a group which is obviously committed to the performance of new music. Uh, so that's music from the 20th century and the 21st century. Um, now, I understand uh, as a listener, contemporary music can be quite difficult to get into. Uh, the same is also true as a performer. Uh, so what I wanted to do today was to try to illustrate how I might get inside a piece uh, with reference to one piece in particular, which is Jonathan Harvey's Curve with Plateau. Uh, this is a piece for a solo cello, which was written in 1982 for Helen Verney originally, and it's, it's quite sort of in the repertoire. Now, there are lots of cellists who play it, and it's been performed a lot of times. So when I first came across this, uh, about 25 years ago, something like that, um, uh, I was asked, it, was, it all happened at quite sort of short notice, as is often the case. Um, I think the cellist who was supposed to play this uh, was about to have a baby, and the baby decided to come early. So I got a phone call saying, would you be able to play in this concert of contemporary music? Oh, and by the way, uh, there's a piece for solo cello, and I thought, Sure, why not? What could possibly go wrong? Um, so I got the piece of music through the post in those days. It was like before PDFs and email and all that kind of stuff. Well, I didn't have email. Um, and I had a look at it. And first of all, at a cursory glance, I kind of had a look and thought, right, okay, yeah, I can play that, can play that. Um, wait a minute, really? Does it go that high? And I looked further and it thought, God, this goes even higher. That's not possible. Surely that's a mistake. Um, and uh, so what I did was uh, rather foolishly, I phoned up Jonathan um, and uh, I said, um, I, think, I think you've made a mistake here, Jonathan. You can't really mean that it goes two octaves higher than you've written. And he said, oh, well, yes, I do, actually. Because, of course, he was a cellist himself. And he knew exactly what he was doing, so I had egg on my face there. Um, but that's one of the great things, I guess, about playing contemporary music, is that uh, often the composers are still alive. Um, so you can ring him or her up and ask their advice or ask them to clarify something. So that's one positive thing. Now, um, so the first challenge of this piece for me was, uh, obviously, to play this very, very high music. Now this I'm talking about sort of playing right off the end of the fingerboard. So this, for those of you who don't know, this black thing here is the fingerboard, like fretboard or whatever. Um, and normally you just kind of stay within the confines of that. Uh, but this is asking you to play right up beyond there, sort of very near to the bridge, which is this obviously the wooden thing in the middle there, not the shadow of the bridge. Um, so I'm playing like really high, about sort of... So you get that kind of whistling sound. Uh, now this is difficult in two ways, in that, uh, first of all, because your finger is so close to the bridge, you have to find a place where you can play with the bow. Um, and there's not very much space there, so there's not much margin for error. Do you see what I mean? There's, so it's quite easy to sort of touch your left hand with the bow. So you have to be quite careful with that. And the second challenge of that is um, it's so high, you're in kind of in uncharted territory in a way that normally you kind of, you know roughly where certain notes are. Like, yeah, I know there's a note there, there's a D there, there's an F sharp here. But up here, it's like sort of, where on earth am I? Um, so that took quite a lot of just familiarizing myself with a new kind of geography, if you like. So that's the first thing. Um, next thing I do, and I'm doing all of this, by the way, kind of quite comfortably with a nice cup of coffee at my kitchen table and just kind of looking through the score. And I just want to emphasize that, well, for me anyway, that's a really, really useful way of um, starting with any new piece. 
because uh, you can kind of do a lot of what I call clerical work, just kind of sorting out notes, sorting out rhythms, just in your head, before you actually bring the piece to the cello, as it were. Um, and that's really invaluable. It's just, just kind of, particularly with things which are, uh, are new and, and, and strange, it's great to sort of be able to just kind of say, right, I'm going to forget about the cello just for a minute and just concentrate on what the composer is trying to say. So, often with these new ground-breaking pieces, um, there are techniques which are being asked for which um, you may never have come across before. Okay, and now, often as not, there's quite a lot of music that you do recognize and you say, oh yeah, I know that, I know that. Schoenberg did that, or Stockhausen did that, so I know roughly how to do that. But sometimes there are things which you think, what on earth does that mean? So first thing I saw here was a strange bit of notation, which I believe um, Phoebe may have passed out to everyone already. So there'll be a little quiz at the end to see if you can understand how to do it. No prizes, <laughs> I'm afraid. Anyway, uh, this is like uh, a funny kind of glissando effect. So. Glissando basically means a slide. You go like this. Um, now, you can do a glissando on the cello on one note. You could even do it on two notes. Like this. But what Jonathan is asking the performer to do here is to do it on four notes. So four different strings, which isn't physically possible because... Um, of the kind of curvature of the bridge. So, what he's actually asking, I later discovered, and also he told me, um, was that he wants you to play not each note together, but consecutively, as it were, but slide up at the same time, which gives this incredible effect, like this. It's... <laughs> It's a very kind of novel sort of sound. Um, and I kind of thought, yeah, this is wonderful. This is really great. And add to that, he wants me to play a ponticello as well, which means playing very close to the bridge with the bow. So you get this. That kind of whistling sort of sound. So the combination of those two things gives a very kind of distinctive oral um, sort of marker, if you like. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, he does this a number of times throughout the piece, let's see where he does it. Um, and each time he does it, there's like a sort of, there's a sudden jump in register for the cello. Okay, so this is something else I should explain about the shape of the piece. He starts very low, in the kind of very lowest register there. <laughs> kind of markers there. He jumps up to the this register, which is kind of like the tenor register. And then we have another marker. Um, it goes over. We're suddenly in a higher register now. And then he works his way up the cello so that we end up in this very high music that I demonstrated earlier. The yeah. Um, and then he comes back down again through the different registers, ending up with... Uh, yeah. Ending up with the bass register. So immediately, I've got a kind of hook into the piece about what, what the structure is, which is quite clear. And then obviously... The title, Curve with Plateau, comes from that. So you get the, the shape of the thing going right up from the bottom of the instrument to the very top and staying there and then coming back down again and finishing at the bottom. Um, now this was also, I'm kind of thinking, so what's, what's immediately this is intriguing here? So what's behind this? What, is this? what does this mean? And um, again, through conversation with Jonathan and also kind of thinking about it myself, I sort of come to the conclusion that these are sort of different states of the human existence. So we've got the, 
the bass, the which is kind of the musculature, the sort of bones and muscles of humanity. And then you go through this sort of trance chant-like passage there. It's a very kind of mesmeric thing. To something which is more about the emotions. So you get... Um, uh, kind of slightly more sort of emotive and then he goes higher and higher and higher and introduces this music which is a bit like bird song though. all those kind of trills until he gets to the very very highest register there. And this is kind of supposed to represent the soul, spirituality. And he stays there for a good two or three minutes, and then comes back down again through the emotions, through this chant, and then finishes with the bones again. And then he adds something to the end, the, these kind of bow strikes, which we call Ricochet. I think that's example number two in your little quiz. Um, so I'm already giving you the answers. There we go. Um, all for free. Uh, so ricochet basically means letting the bow bounce. So you kind of throw it into the string. And just let it bounce. And there are about 20 of these hits at the end. All with more and more space in between them. And that's like a kind of... Uh, intimation of mortality at the end. So you get muscles going all the way up to spirituality, down again, followed by death. Great shape. Um, next thing that I'm looking at is the... Oh, is there anything else that's kind of demanding for me? And one of these things is quarter tones. Okay, now, um, normally you have uh, just semitones, okay? That's what we normally deal with. So you get uh, 12, I think, in a scale. <laughs> Um, so that's how a scale is normally divided, but more and more composers have used, have divided the semitone in half. So you get, yeah, so you get the, the quarter tone in between the semitone. Um, and I guess over the years people have used this um, in various different ways. So I'm kind of thinking, right, are there any of these because I hate playing quarter tones because they're quite hard to pitch. Um, and how is Jonathan using them here? Well, I think he's kind of using them to sort of colour the language a little bit. So let me play you an example of um, one little theme that he uses. Um, so I'm going to play it as it would sound without the quarter tones. It sounds like this. Uh... Okay. So it's quite a sort of simple theme. But what he does is that he flattens that second note by a quarter tone. So you get... So it kind of gives, gives the material a sort of flavour, you know, a, a colour. So I'm kind of thinking, okay, what does this actually make it sound like? As a performer, I'm thinking this. And, and uh, it feels kind of quite ethnic to me. It feels like it has almost like a sort of uh, Native American feel. Um, so I'm thinking, how does that fit with the, with the rest of it? And I'm thinking, yeah, that could work at the beginning. The... So already I'm becoming sort of, uh, how would you say, like emotionally invested in the music. So I've got... I've got this sort of idea which I think, yeah, this is my idea, you know. And, and so that's how I'm sort of getting a hook into the music, first of all by structure and then by emotion. And then I should say later on down on this, I've played this piece quite a lot over the years. Um, I actually added something which wasn't 
in the pie. Now, obviously, this is a, a dangerous avenue to go down because we should all try, I guess, you know, to do exactly what the composer wants. But it's all, I suppose, this is all about kind of taking ownership of the piece as a performer. Um, so what I thought of was the opening, there's nothing marked in terms of vibrato, but I thought maybe I'd add something which sound, makes it sort of sounds more uh, like that sort of Native American chanting, the... <laughs> almost over vibrato, which he does actually ask for later on in the piece. So I felt kind of justified in doing that. Anyway, as I say, it's a dangerous tightrope, that because, you know, you don't want to sort of implant things on a piece. You want to try to sort of draw them out. But there comes a point, I guess, where, as I say, you sort of almost take ownership of the piece and, and it becomes something that you can add to. You part, become part of the creative process, maybe. Discuss. Anyway, um, I guess that's pretty much all I wanted to say about the piece. You know, um, what's going to happen now is that I'm going to play Jonathan Harvey's Curved Plateau, and uh, there will be a chance afterwards for you to ask questions. Please do just text them in via the YouTube channel or via Twitter, and. After I've played it, uh, I will do my best to answer them, or at least engage in some kind of dialogue. Okay, so this is Jonathan Harvey's Curved Plateau, and I hope that the little kind of demonstrations I've given you will, will help you to kind of hook into the, the structure of the music.
And that was Jonathan Harvey's Curve with Plateau. A very, I think, a very effective and kind of powerful emotional piece. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and I hope what I said was useful beforehand. Now I have my very wonderful, beautiful assistant, Samantha here. No, not Samantha. Jodie, my lovely wife. And she is going to pass me some of your questions. Is that right? Yeah, why don't you come on camera? This is Jodie. Hello there. Um, Natalie Gaylor writes, apart from a big thank you, <laughs> which was fantastic, are there contemporary composers known for not giving you any freedom for ownership? And on the contrary, are there composers that give you lots of space for interpretation? Whoa, controversial question, Natalie. Well, um, I would say some composers are more prescriptive than others in terms of uh, what they're demanding, you know, and I guess, you know, they, they want you to play exactly what they've written. Um, and there's not much room for argument. Um, I guess uh, the more hardcore ones like Stockhausen are a bit like that. Um, Generally, though, it kind of depends, actually. I mean, I think, I, think, I think it depends on the composer's personality, really. And it was interesting. I had a dis discussion with uh, Emma Ruth Richards about a week ago about this, you know, sort of whether um, how much control she took about her pieces sort of once they'd uh, flown the nest, as it were, once she'd finished writing them. And she said, not at all. Uh, that you know, she would rather composers just kind of took them, and once she'd composed them, that that was it, I suppose. Um, and Debussy, I think, had a very similar attitude uh, in that he felt he would write the piece, and then it was in the performer's hands. And uh, you know, if they decided to change things, that was okay. It sort of had a life of its own. Um, so I would say it kind of, it, it sort of depends really on the composer's 
as um, character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is from me, but it's on behalf of a lot of my students. How long did it take for this piece to get under your skin, where you weren't just doing the clerical work? In, in terms of, did you have to perform it a lot? Does it take weeks, months, years? Mm. Well, I think that, I mean, there are, there are certain pieces which have a sort of immediate power and impact. Um, and this is certainly one of them. I think it's, you know, it has the emotion and the shape is, is, is quite clear, I think, and as it is for the audience too. Um, that's not to say that uh, it doesn't sort of mature or change with time, you know, and I think, I think um, uh, that has been very much my experience with this piece, you know, it's, it's something that I've played a lot over the years, and um, although the basic shape doesn't change, you know, my, my, my interpretation of it, I guess, deepens, I hope, anyway. Um, Robert McFarland writes... Where and in what context have you played this wonderful piece? Um, well, I guess I've played it all over the place. Um, uh, I think the first place I played was in Royal Holloway College. Um, I don't remember much about that because I was so scared at the time. Um, and I've played it at the Wigmore Hall, I've played it various um, places, I've played it over in Florida, uh, various places I guess around the world and it, it's always kind of, it always has a good audience response I think, so it's, it's something useful to kind of throw into programs. Mm. Some really good questions coming up here, thank you everybody out there, it's great. Uh, Abby Lorimer writes, she's really enjoyed your discussion and performance. She's just wondering what some of your other favourite contemporary cello pieces are. Um, well, um, I'm going to talk about one piece which is very different from this, which is uh, um, a piece by Janis Senekis called Kotos, which uh, it's difficult to describe it as a favourite piece of mine because it's such a kind of... Uh, tortuous process trying to learn it. It's very kind of uncompromising, very uh, strident, difficult music, I would say. Um, no kind of melody, no, no harmony, but sort of harsh sound. But uh, it's a piece that I've kind of come to love in a funny kind of way over the years, um, because it just has this kind of uh, primal power and um, it, it's, it's almost a sort of uh, anti-music piece in a funny kind of way. And yet at the same time, it has this incredible imagery about it. So it, it, it conjures up these uh, prehistoric wastelands where gods and titans are kind of fighting it out. And I, I just love it. It just, it just uses a cello in a, in a, in a totally novel way very uncompromising way and um, yeah it's one of my favorites I think I think I'll just let you know that I remember Tim learning that piece many bars of it mm. but one bar took you you came out of the lounge swearing the air was blue yeah. and you said it has just taken me a whole hour to learn one bar yeah it's complex music but you love it now I love it you and I know another interesting story I was I, I Jody is a cellist as I'm sure many of you know, wonderful cellist. Um, and uh, we often sort of play things to each other just to sort of sound yes. each other out, you know. And so I played this piece to her. <laughs> and her initial response was one of total horror and disgust, I think. And she had to leave the room. She said, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. Um, but Jolie being Jolie, she kind of got, you kind of got inside it, didn't you? And you, yeah. you sort of, uh, you sort of say, yeah, okay, I, I can it see with that. You. You know, that, yeah, that's supposed to represent a sort of weird kind of monster, yeah, and you, you sort of, you helped me to believe in it, I guess, which is... Well, nice. we sort of went on the journey together, I just yeah. didn't have to do all the learning bit, that was really nice. <laughs> okay, Cheska, who says your playing is incredible, by the way, oh. asks, have you ever performed graphic contemporary music scores that don't use standard notation? And if so, how do you approach them? Does that scare you, or are you used to it? 
graphic notation. So that um, uh, that means, I guess, uh, no Pictures, notes, but, no but notes. just yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I, th I think initially it does it does scare me. I'm just trying to think of something that I've played recently. Um, I mean, the, the, there is one piece actually that we both played together recently. I'm not sure if it qualifies as this, which was called Match by uh, Maurizio Cargo, um, which uses a lot of notation, which I don't think either of us had ever seen before. Mm. Um, and all I can say is thank God for YouTube because um, it's it's a sort of it's such a great resource that you know all these things that are written down, which actually. Um, it's it's open to debate what some of them mean, I think, but but we could sort of have a choice of um, watching various performances of this. Ah, oh, okay, that's what he's supposed to be doing, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, it is. It, it's I suppose it's quite scary uh, in that there's always a deadline with these things, and you sort of think, right, I need to perform this piece in two weeks' time, and uh, I need to not look like a complete idiot. So I, I have to sort of make some decisions about about what this actually means. So yeah, scary from that point of view. Right, Tim, I'm going to now hurry you along because yep. there are quite a few questions. Okay. So yep. one sentence answers, please. Okay. Yep. Um, oh, oh, lovely. Oh, there's a chap who said, oh, I hope this will be safe for later. It is, you can catch all of these. If you haven't caught this live, you can catch it later. That's for Ian Harrison. And definitely it's worth subscribing because you get sent uh, emails about future events. Paul Silverthorne asks, oh, I like this question. Did you listen much to other performances as you learnt it? Or did you wait till you formed your own view of it? Um, interesting, yeah. I, I, um, with this particular piece, no, I didn't listen to any other performances. I don't think I've ever heard it played by anyone else, which is a, a, a shame because I know a lot of people play it and I'm sure play it absolutely wonderfully. Um, I guess because of the circumstances of my first performance of this, I, where I just had to sort of throw it together, um, that was a sort of bit of a learning curve, and um, uh, it's it's always felt a sort of quite a sort of personal journey for me this particular piece. So no, I haven't listened to other performances, but I normally do. <laughs> it does help. Okay. Yeah. So Hector, I don't know how to pronounce mm. Hector's surname, but it looks rather beautiful. Oh, oh good. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Could you speak a little bit about extended techniques? And I think what he's really interested in is he says, especially the ones you consider less cliche. So are there some that are cliche in which case? And more interesting personally to you? Um, wow, that's a, quite a big question, Hector. Um, uh, perhaps that's the sort of subject for another for another. Um, I think that's another one workshop. of these actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean there, there, there are so many of them, and, and uh, you sort of put me on the spot. I can't kind of quite think of ones that uh, are particularly personal to me. Um, or that you've perhaps played a piece where you particularly yeah. enjoyed. I'm yeah. thinking maybe. I mean, there is that one in, in, in Kotos where yeah. it has these um, funny sort of double slides. So you've got one. You got, uh, sorry, this is glissandi again. Normally you'd have both notes if you're doing a two note glissandi going up at the same time. But he does this sort of weird thing where he sort of. So one of them's going up at one speed and one of them's going up at another one, which is a sort of extraordinary technique, um, but very effective, I think. Yeah. Okay. Now, I can't pronounce this name because I think it's a YouTube sign-in name, but I like this, Achbudkiz, says, fantastic, thank you. Please, could you explain the harmonic-like sounds you made without using your left hand at about the same time as you put oh, the yeah. beat on? Yeah. That's clever. This is a well-noticed. <laughs> yeah, that really well-observed. Um, okay, so this, this is basically a sort of ponticello thing, so playing nearer to the bridge. This, this is the bridge here. <laughs> Um, so normally you have that voice. Now the closer to the bridge you play, the more upper partials, upper harmonics you get. Um, so that's really, it's just a, a way of kind of playing with that. So coming in and out of those different partials by slightly 
altering where you're playing on the string. So you get the... That kind of thing, yeah? So that's, that's what that is. And then he sort of enhances that by asking you to actually pick out notes gradually with your left hand on there. So you get that kind of effect. Yeah. Uh, he was a cellist, by the way, Johnson, so he would kind of mm. knew very much what he was doing. Yeah. Mm. Uh, by the way, Hector's replied with a he 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 yeah. on his rather big question, but I think it's rather good, Hector. I think that is, that is another hour's worth with a bit of workshopping. Yeah. Right, we've had quite a few from Anton Littram, who really loves Kotos. He thinks it's one of Zeneca's best works. Yeah. Uh, the first two minutes are so wonderfully sublime to me the way the harsh roar of the pressure facing the glistening harmonics. Mm. I agree with you actually, having, having gone through a little bit of a road to Damascus about it myself. He's heard it in concert more than once and it's always fantastic. So he's actually writing about something interesting and I've come across Bachmann as well with Sinfonetta. Yeah. Speaking about graphical notation, what are your thoughts on Lachmann's pressure, uh, pression? I don't know that yeah, right. And yeah. the notation there. I know Arditi encourages everyone writing string pieces to use Lachenmann's notation. Yeah, um, again, that's maybe something that I don't want to get into right now, as I think we have a sort of time limitation, but i um, be more than happy to engage with you uh, about that on another occasion. Oh, I actually yeah. remember... What do you think? Well, yeah, I remember on. speaking to Lachenmann about it, and I said, look, it's got to go up on YouTube. It's just got to go up yeah. so that everyone can see what's happening and what you mean by it. And it just just, just clears up hours yeah. and hours of rehearsal, quite yeah. honestly. It just yeah. makes it really simple. Yeah. And yes, once you know what it's about, it's, it's logical and simple. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Okay, Anna Harvey writes, oh that's nice, thanks Tim, wonderful and so interesting to hear your perspective as a performer. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Springate says, good question Dan, how do you, I ask, I think <laughs> this, how do you balance the portrayal of very intense, harsh, harsh musical gestures with staying physically and mentally cool? Ah, uh, well... Yeah, Always I mean, the uh, issue difficult. for a performer, really. I think it, a, a lot of it really is Dan is about pacing. Actually, that you know there are some there are some bits um, which are going to take a lot more out of you physically, uh, and you just have to um, make sure that you conserve enough energy for those bits, I guess. And so that I mean, what often happens, particularly with a piece like Kotos, I think, is that you it's very easy to kind of um, to sort of give everything too soon. <clears throat> so uh, then you, can, you just get sort of cramp or you get tired or whatever. So you just need to, I guess, play, perform it a lot and, and, you know, clock where those moments are so that you can kind of just pace yourself like a, like a runner would, you know, sort of pacing yourself for that home straight sprint. So Ben Finley writes, uh, and he says, thank you for introducing me to this piece. It is a jolly good piece. Uh, co contemporary music can be difficult to interpret because often it's so hard to achieve on a technical level. I think that's a fair point. What do you think players should consider to make their performances speak more? Um, well, I think it's important well for me anyway it's important never to lose sight of uh of what your instrument does of what of what your instrument is you know and and the the cello i suppose is basically a sort of singing cantabile instrument although obviously you can do all these different things um but i think it's important to when there are moments uh, of beauty in a piece that that, that you really enjoy them as you would in any other piece of music, you know. Um, so it, it's kind of bringing your experience of other types of music into contemporary music. So that, that, that's always been very important for me anyway, I think. Yeah. Okay. Got a lovely comment. This is the last one here mm -hmm. from M. Barclay. 
I'm, tr- I'm wondering if it was Michael, but anyway, mm. completely captivating. There you are, Tim. Mm, Tim was a bit nervous, but I said, <laughs> fine. Um, both explanation and performance. Thank you, Tim, from someone new to this sound world, so it won't be Michael Barclay, it'll be mm-hmm. someone else. Could you do a workshop like this every day, please? Oh, right. Well, that's, I guess, up to... I definitely think there's room for more. Yeah, oh. yeah. Well, as, you know, I hope you've enjoyed this, this format. Um, as I say, there, there will be another one next week, which will be given by the London Symphony Editor's principal clarinetist, Mark van der Veel, and that will be at five o'clock next Monday. Um, I, just before I, I go, I just wanted to... Um, take this opportunity to, to, to thank various people. Um, first of all, the Arts Council, um, which obviously underpins everything that London Symphony Editor does, and they're being incredibly supportive and flexible in this very challenging time for all artistic organisations, so thank you to them, but also to the individuals who, who uh, support the, our different sort of commissions and all of our work, um, not least of which Sir Stephen Oliver, who is um, who supports my position as uh, principal cellist in London Sinfonietta. So, as I say, uh, thank you to all of them. Thank you, most of all, to you for tuning in to listen, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I will see you again soon, I hope. Bye for now.